Okay, so here are the notes for today's chapter. It, it's also very long, so I didn't include some of the cool parts. But if I want to mention them, I have to work in the in the other tab. So I will just change it quickly. Okay, so for today's chapter, uh, we discussed discrete random variables. Um, basically, they are a way to assign a number to some event from some experiment. In the previous chapter, we were uh, computing probabilities of events. So now to such to such events, we are going to assign other numbers and they are, they are going to be called states and such states will also get some probability. Uh, the learning objectives are, as I said, convert the events or statements to numbers. These via random variables. And then to such random variables, we will assign probabilities via the other concept, the probability math function. And we will formalize what is the expected result or the ex expectation from an experiment. Okay, so the first part, we are going to define when, what random variables are. Uh, they're basically a function that maps events to numbers. Um, the mathematical way to, to denote that would be this over here, where remember omega is the sample space, the, the set of all the possible outcomes, outcomes of the experiment. Uh, now, to work with these random variables, we're going to use this notation. That, that is, what is the probability that the random variable X uh, takes a value A? And what it stands for is simply the probability of this event. The event uh, X takes a value A, a that is defined as the following, right? Which are the possible outcomes where uh, the value of such event was assigned to this real value A. That's simply the notation. And now that we have the random variables, that is that that assign from event to a number, we can get some probabilities out of that via this probability math function. And it works like follows. And we already assign events to numbers via random variables. And um, as I mentioned, those numbers denote the states of a random variable. That is which which uh, which events took place. So now we are going to ask what is the probability of some state occurring? That is what I had written over here. The probability that the state A occurred. And we're simply going to denote that uh, via the PMF the probability math function. Um, the way to write it is over here. The probability math function of the random variable X is this over here, which as I said, is there is the probability that a certain state from X, from X has occurred. And in this case, the state X in lowercase. Okay. I think over here comes some examples. No, it's mainly uh, properties. Okay, so let's see some example. There was one over here where they basically counting heads. I want to show that first before diving too much into the properties of these thing, things. Let's see. Okay, this one over here. So we have some experiments where we are flipping a coin twice. So the sample space is just these outcomes, right? Head, 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 tails, tails, head, or tail, tails, tails. And now what we're doing is we're counting the number of heads that we get from this coin, double coin toss. Uh, to each one of these events, we assign, we assign a number, we are counting the number of heads. So for example, for the event uh, double head, the value of this random variable would be two. For this other event, uh, tails head, it would be one. Similar for the event head tails, 
And lastly, the event tail tails, there are no heads, so the value of the random variable is zero. Now we have already defined the random variable X as number of heads, so we can calculate its PMF via the formal definition, right? This one, this one over here. And that would be, for example, what's the PMF at zero? We simply calculate what's the probability that X equals zero, and that is what's the probability that there were no heads. As we can see, it's only this case, right? What's the probability of this event? Tails, tails. And that we we already know how to do it from the previous chapter, and it's just one fourth. And similarly for the other values, the number of heads can be zero, one, or two because we are only flipping it twice. And so for each one of these values, we can compute it. Let, let's do a final example. For example, the PMF at the value one is the probability that one head occurred and which events are associated to that value of x. That is when does one head, only one head occurs and that is for the events tails head and the event head tails. So we have already learned how to count it. Sorry, how to calculate this probability? It's just one half. Okay, so that's basically what a PMF, sorry, what, what a random variable is doing. It assigns to events numbers, as we can see here, and then we can retrieve a probability from that random variable by simply asking what is the probability that a random variable takes some real value, as we have seen here. Now, I believe that what comes next is uh, why this probability and um, sorry why the PMF becomes useful. So let's let's continue. Let's say PMF and probability measure. Yeah, the PMF is a weighing function for discrete random variables. Um, two random variables are different where their PMFs are distinct. So basically, every random variable is uniquely identified via its PMF, which will be also a good identification to what a distribution from a random variable means. Uh, well, this is just a, a property. And the proof is in the book is very simple. We are simply asking the probability out of all possible values. And as we saw, the probability of the sample space is one. So in the proof, it's really yes, rewriting this in the form of events, and it's a pretty trivial theory. Okay, so now what I was mentioning before, why are the PMF useful? And it's basically because uh, they are a sort of ideal histogram. As we know, histograms uh, can be a measure of the frequency of a state. We are counting how many occurrences of some value have arised. But with PMFs, we're, we're almost doing the same, but in probabilistic terms. So what we mean by the PMF being an ideal histogram is basically this. Uh, we know that histograms are usually empirical. That is, we generate them from a collected data set. And such histograms are also change depending on, on the data set. Uh, so the idea, is that the PMF is sort of a, a limit object in the sense that the bigger the data set, its histograms will converge to a, to a PMF, that is to a distribution or an ideal histogram, uh, which is also what the PMF stands for. So let's think of a PMF as a limit of the histogram as, they, as we collect more and more data. Uh, which, uh, which is exhibiting the distribution from a certain experiment. Okay, so that, that's basically the, the first part. What are random variables and what are the PMF? Is it clear up to that point or is there any comment or questions? So, sorry, I, I think I, I, when I was reading the, the part where it talks about the the pre-image, I, 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 it was quite 
very abstract to me. So I, I don't know, maybe later I, that could be. Yeah, this, uh, this part, you know, when it introduced that, I was a bit lost. Uh, yeah, it was over here, right? Yeah, yeah, this it is when he was explaining this definition. Yeah, yeah so basically, rem remember X is assigning a number to each possible outcome. There is to each element in the sample space, right? So when, when we write this, the, the pre-image of the, of the number A, we are simply asking which, uh, which outcomes are such that when we map them via X, we get A. That is, which, which events uh, have an X value of A that is over here, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, with respect to community- I mean, I could, could just add something to that because I also found this section a little bit like opaque at first, right? I mean, it's like, why do we, I mean, can't we just talk about the probability of one? Why do we need to talk about, no, it's not a probability of one, it's, I mean, it is, but you have to take about one and think about what the image of one is on the, on the underlying probability space. And it seems rather abstract, but um, I think it's important to have this behind the theory. So I think, you know, you, later on, you'll just forget about this. You'll be like, oh yeah, what's the probability that X equals one? It's fine. We don't have to worry about the pre-image and all that. It doesn't really come back to haunt you, but I did find one useful part when we talked about the fact that, you know, two PMFs weren't the same, because, even though they had the same values, right? Because their images were different. Do you remember that section? Um, do someone compare, comparing two PMFs? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I remember reading this. Yeah. I don't know. That the part section, but... cleared it up for me. I'm like, oh, I see. So it is important. It's not just, probably X is one is equal to a half pro and probably the y is one equal to half but there are different events underneath them that are happening they're actually opposite events in the underlying event space so when you talk about more than one random variables and their correlations i think it might be useful just to have that in the back of your mind that, oh yeah there's some underlying event space that's that drives it yep. i guess in some sense. anyway that particular example that helped me maybe that'll help you yeah there it is 3.2 yeah that section Oh, interesting. Okay, so yeah, they are uh, not yeah. unique identifiers. They are only after you consider also the 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 random variable that they are assigned to. Yeah. Okay. That for some reason that little example really cleared up. Oh, I see why this matters. <laughs> okay. So now to the next part the community distribution distribution functions, but only for the discrete case. And so we denote all these long words, a CDF. Um, as it's mentioned, it's basically a cumulative, cumulative sum of the PMF from minus infinity up to a certain value. Um, that is clear in the definition. You consider a discrete random variable Ah, I, I didn't mention that. Discrete uh, stands for the, the set, uh, the image of X, that is the numbers that you are assigning to the event. And that whole set is countable. So it's its size is as, at most uh, the same size as the uh, natural numbers, like one, two, three, and such. Uh, in that case, uh, the definitions, uh, they become a little easier to work with because we are dealing with sums, so sometimes infinite, but we are still not really dealing with like Riemann integration because sums are integrals, but uh, that's not important. We are not really integrating over very complex functions because the, the set of states, that is the image of X, it's countable. Okay, so now the CDF of this discrete random variable is defined as this sum, right? Uh, the probability that the value of x is less or equal than this specific value. So it's just a cumulative sum, and we can we can take note of that in this example. We consider uh, we're here. We are also counting. I think it's the same in the previous exercise. But we were simply consider 
considering an experiment where we flip a coin twice and we count the number of heads. For example, one, four. Yeah, it's the same. We're considering this, this exact, exact scenario. And now we're computing, right? Which is the CN, CDF, sorry, of this discrete random variable that counts the number of heads after flipping a coin twice. For example, uh, f of x at zero, by definition, simply the probability that there are uh, less than less or equal to zero number of heads. Um, that would be simply this probability and it's one fourth, the, prob the, prob the probability of no heads. Then f of x at one would be the probability that <laughs> there is one or less heads. And this would be simply the sum, right, of these two elements. And similarly for the, the probability that there are less than, no, two or less than two heads after flipping a coin twice. And in this case, it's simply the, the well, the graphic of this experiment, right? We have the states, zero, one, or two heads. We have the probabilities associated to such, such states. And we simply plot what we had over here. This would be the PMF. And now it's, it's cumulative sum of such probabilities would be simply it's CDF. So you can see over here. Um, in the book, they mentioned that where we're working with CDF, CDF, if PMF already were nice enough to work with. And he goes in a little bit of a tangent because it seemed, it, he mentioned, right? If you haven't read, no, if it's your first time reading the book, you, you can skip this section. But the, the main the, the main point in that section is that if we are only working with PMFs, it's a little bit hard to integrate and because these points are isolated. So if we were to integrate this function and the value is zero, but if you now work with its CDF, that is this whole graph, then now we can use uh, the tool, right, of mathematical integration. We can see over here that now it does make sense, the question of which is the area under this graph, under this curve, right? So that's the main point where, we're, where we are using CDF. Okay. So now a couple of properties of the CDF. He mentions that uh, maybe it would be uh, beneficial to show this uh, next to the graph. For example, this is a CDF, right, of a random variable that is counting the number of, of heads after flipping two coins. And as we can see from this graph, it, it satisfies that the sequence is increasing in unit steps, like we see here. It also achieves a maximum, uh, well, at infinity. In this case, as we see after two, the value is already one. Um, it will keep on that value from later on, at least for this specific case. Another property is that the CDF has a minimum at zero uh, when considering minus infinity. So we can see here that as we approach, well, it's not graphed, but as we approach from the left of zero, this, uh, this staircase actually is in the value, in the x-axis, because its value is zero in all of the three. And similar, similarly, over here, he mentions that the CDF has jumps where, where our position six, where such value has a PMF a positive PMF value. So as we can see here, for the states, zero, one, and two, which they have positive, <coughs> positive PMF. <coughs> this, this thing over here. In those cases, it's that this staircase is jumping up. 
uh, states with positive pin. Uh, and uh, a later note, <coughs> ah, there is a comment. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's just me, the, sorry. Listen, the last note about CDFs is how to convert between PM, PMFs and CDFs. Um, they, they did basically this, right? You have your discrete random variable. So the, the set of states, it's countable. So we can label it x1, x2, and such. And, and these are numbers. So it, it holds that the PMF evaluated at x sub k is just the, the difference between the CDF at x sub, x sub k minus the CDF at the previous value that is at x sub k minus one. And, and that is well, in a way obvious because the CDF is simply the cumulative sum of the PMF. Okay. So now to the to, to one of the main points of the of this chapter, and that is to formalize what is expected uh, event, no, sorry, the expected output or expected result uh, after an experiment. And that is the idea, sorry, the concept of expectation. And he also mentions that, as we saw, uh, we can think of the PMF as a sort of ideal histogram as we gather more and more da data from a specific sample. So I'm sorry for a specific population, but now he also mentions that there is not only that idea of, of, of convergence of limit objects that happens between the PMF and the histogram, but also between the idea of the mean and the standard deviation from a, from a sample. And what we are going to define as the mean and the standard deviation for, of, a, of a random variable. There is, going, there is also going to be some sense of convergence between such objects. Uh, okay, so now he defines, right, the, the expectation of a random variable X, and it's simply this weighted sum. We are summing the, the states, that is the value that we are assigning to the, to the events. And we are weighting such states via the probability. So it's kind of a, an average. And um, also we can mention that in that sense, the expectation is the mean of the random variable X, but that, also, that does not mean that this expectation uh, necessarily matches with some state. Uh, it's actually more like the expectation is a center of mass between all of the states. So as an example of that, we have uh, a little generalization of, of the problem that we were focusing on before, that is flipping, flipping a coin twice. Now we're going to flip a coin three times. I think it's called thrice, I, I don't remember. But the idea is that uh, such experiment is going to be associated with some reward, in this case, via, via a game. So the, the game works as follows. You flip a coin three times, uh, you get a reward in the following scenarios. No reward if there are only zero or one head. You get one dollar if there are two heads, and um, eight dollars if there were three heads after you flip the coin three times. So we're going to model right this game and this experiment via random variables. And we do as follows, right? We, as we did with the previous case, we define the random variable X, where we are simply going to count the number of heads that we get after flipping a fair coin three times. Um, as we can see, the reward is also going to be a, a non-deterministic because it depends on, a, on a, how do you say aleatory? A, aleatory? In a, because it depends on a non-deterministic experiment. We, we don't know what 
the outcome of flipping a coin every time is going to be. So in that sense, we can also model the reward via a random variable, via something non-deterministic. So we simply uh, ask ourselves, right? Because the random variable X is going to take values from the sample face and they give it a number, right? Give count the number of heads. So what's the sample space? It's simply all the possible values, sorry, events after flipping a coin three times. And the outcomes are head, head, heads, head, head, tails, and such, until tail, tails, tails. So, so what are the probabilities, right? Sorry, what are the, what is the PMF of X? And what is the probability that there are zero heads? It's only one out of eight in this case. What is the probability that there was only one head? Well, we can count and it is three eights. And similarly, until what is the probability that there is only three heads and that is one eight in this case. Now, this is for the X random variable. So we can now do the same with the Y random variable. In that case, what's the probability that there is no reward that is Y equals zero? In that case, as we mentioned in the start, no reward only happens when there is zero or one head. So zero heads or it's inter interpreted as plus or one head. So we're only calculating the PMF of Y via the PMF of X using these conditions that we established in the beginning. So that happens over here. So now we have the PMF of X and the PMF of Y. So why is the reward obtained from the game? So what is the expected reward? It would be this calculation, right? The expected reward from this game. So we would have to consider every state from Y and multiply it by its probability. So now the state zero, zero reward by the probability of such a state. The state you get one dollar multiplied by the probability and the state you get eight dollars multiplied by this probability. Uh, and for example, one sense in, in which this expectation is useful is the following. We know that this expected reward is 11 eights. So this is a sense, in a sense, and the mean reward or the average reward that you get from, that you get from this game. So if this game, if the, if the price to play this game is greater than 11 eights, that is it greater than the, our expected reward, then as we play and more and more this game, we would be expected to lose money on, on average. If we, if the if the cost of the game were actually uh, what do you say lesser lesser than the expected reward, then the opposite happens, right? As you play more and more, we're we're expected to earn money. So that's a useful a useful uh, way to to work with expectations as an average. Uh, now, okay, now <laughs> there is a little tangent about the existence of the expectations. That is, if this, if this sums always converges. And of course, see, if there are only a finite, finite amount of states, it's trivial, it will converge. But as you consider, an inf sorry, an, an, a countable uh, number of states, then this sum, when it, it becomes a series, then it may not converge. So the author, the author mentions that not every PMF has an expectation. There is not always this sum. The sum for the expectation converges, but it, it does converge if the case, in the case where the random variable is absolutely summable. And then he defines that a discrete random variable X is absolutely summable if this series over here converges. Uh, but he mentions also that at least in, in real life scenarios, most of the random variables that we work with, they're absolutely summable. 
So it's like we can always assume the existence of the expected value of the expectation. And okay, now we have all the properties of these expectations. And well, there, there isn't really much to say. Okay, just uh, this one over here. Uh, not really, not much. It's more like we were we are going to use this. Well, it it will be used later on for computing <coughs> expectations of of some common discrete random variables, but it's not like we have to memorize this. Um. So, and this this part it's a little more useful, I think. I think because, uh, because of this. What he defines as the gate moment of a random variable. Uh, at least in the book, he only defines this, defines this. Uh, well, this is a definition, right? Um, but <coughs> from a little bit of what I have uh, learned in some statistics classes, is that this this gate moment, uh, at least the first moment and the second moment. Uh, they are pretty useful when you are comparing. Uh, you have your data and you want to know if a certain distribution fits it well. You can use these uh, gate moments in order to determine that. So in that sense, that can be that can be useful. They can help you to know if your idea and histogram is really matching the data that you are seeing, or if or if perhaps you have to consider another distribution. Um, and then he defines the variance, right, of a random variable. And it's simply this calculation. But the main idea is also, as I mentioned before, that the square root of, of this variance of the random variable, that is the standard deviation of the random variable index, it is also a limiting object. In the, in the sense that as you gather, sorry, as you fix a population and consider more, sorry, greater and greater samples from the population, then and the standard deviation that you get from such samples, it will converge to standard deviation of the distribution associated to something that you are measuring from the population. So it's also a limiting object. Um, and then some properties. Uh, they are used later on. Okay, so now before going to the last part, that is seeing examples, right, of common random variables, sorry, common discrete random variables. Are there any comments or, or, quest or questions perhaps? Okay, all good. Okay. So in, in this part, uh, I will, I, I didn't know if there was going to be enough time to to show and like a, a good enough summary of the chapter. So I basically just copied the definition and properties and also how do you access, right? Sorry, how do you compute uh, no, sir. How do you use such random variables in R? So it may be a little lacking and maybe repetitive, but if you haven't ready, if you haven't already <coughs> read the chapter, then I I do encourage you to look, for example, at the motivation for some distributions. Uh, sorry, for some random variables that we are going to see, and the connection between them because. Uh, at least what I liked from this part is that he has mentioned uh, also uh, uh, how how that those random variables uh, are used in real life because he does the author does uh, I think uh, a good exposition of showing how these distributions arise in in real life right for example over here how this one arises in, in social networks. 
uh, also the, the Poisson distribution of such. So that may be useful after reading, after seeing this part. Okay, so the first example of the a common discrete random variable is the Bernoulli random variable. We, we so its PMF is as follows. It has for for a value of zero, it gets assigned one minus p, and for a value of one, it gets assigned a value of p, where p in a sense of its some probability, and it's also a fixed value. Uh, greater than zero, but smaller than one. And it's called a Bernoulli parameter. So the states are only two, zero and one. And this distribution is uh, defined, completely defined, but the Bernoulli parameter, P. Now, some properties of the Bernoulli, of Bernoulli random variables. We have, for example, here a uh, distribution that follows, uh, sorry, a random variable that follows a Bernoulli distribution with Bernoulli parameter P. Then the expected value of X is P uh, and the following calls, right? We can calculate, for example, if one wanted to do it manually, we can calculate these variance via the formula that we saw, I think over here. This one. So this was the utility, the utility of mentioning these properties. Okay, so that's for the Bernoulli random variables. And how do you use it in R? Uh, I think there is a package to load the Bernoulli distribution function. But at least the Bernoulli is a special case, sorry, a particular case of a distribution that we are going to see later on. That is called a binomial random variable. And that is this one over here. So if you want to graph the PMF of the Bernoulli distribution, you fix, for example, first the states, and we saw it's zero and one, and then you, you choose uh, a Bernoulli parameter, right? You can see round one. And now we plot the, the states in the x-axis and its PMF values in the y-axis. And in this case, we can use it. So we can calculate those via the DEV norm R function. We only put one over here. That is a particular case that works. And it looks like this, right? Okay. Now another another distribution that I mentioned is the binomial random variable. And as you can see from the name, the binomial is considering this, sorry, is working with this and choose a parameter because uh well at least if you define this, if you define this in a different way. Not directly via this, but as a sum of independent Bernoulli, uh, Bernoulli distributions with parameter p. So as a sum of n Bernoulli distributions with parameter p, then you can compute this using the binomial theorem. So like this doesn't come out of nowhere. It's, it's very related that. The binomial is a sum of independent Bernoulli distributions with the same parameter P. We can, we can also consider this as the number, sorry, that is counting, uh, uh, yeah, that, that the binomial is also considering the probability of of there being k heads after flipping a coin, a fair, no, a, a coin n times, um, and such head, sorry, sorry, and such coin has a probability of p of landing in head. So it's also related to coins, this one over here. 
Also, the Bernoulli was also related to heads. You just flip it once. Um, the probability of landing on one side was P, and of course, the other had to be one minus P. So they are very related, binomial and Bernoulli. Uh, well, these are its, its properties. Um, how do you use it in R? For, for example, we have now two parameters, right? P, a binomial parameter, and the total number of states, that is N. So we can graph the PMF for, in, for all the uh, possible states, there is zero, one, up to N. And simply, to graph this function, we can use the D binomial function for our We have the states and then the parameter, total number of states and the binomial parameter. And while simply graphing it, it becomes like this. Okay. Uh, now, with the geometry random variable, I, I don't remember a, a specific real life case where it comes up, but basically this is a definition that they, that they give. It's PNF, uh, again, you fix a certain, let's call it probability because it's a value between zero and one. Um, now it's only determined by, by one parameter. These are its properties, um, its graph, looks more like this. And we can graph it, the, the PMF of this random variable now via the DG on, uh, <coughs> the DG on function. Perhaps they do mention when the system up, I don't remember. Oh, it seems that they don't. Okay. Well, if, if someone knows and uh, where does a geometric random variable arises in real life, maybe uh, they can comment later on because we are going to finish in this last part. It's just a Poisson random variable. This is actually very popular. So they do mention, for example, where does it come up? In this case, via some physical experiment. But it's also, it also arises as counting the numbers of occurrence of some event and during some interval of time or some, some interval, sometimes uh, an interval is in the sense of a specific region, like, like a place, I mean, region as a place. So yeah, I invite you to read it's the, the, this part over here, I don't know how to say it in English, the real life, and use of the Poisson random variable. Okay, this is PMF. You can see it's very related to the exponential series, sorry, to the Taylor series of the exponential function, e to the x. Um, now it, it only has one parameter, lambda. It's called the Poisson rate. And its properties are as follows. You can graph it via we can graph the PMF via the D plus function. We simply specify the lambda and the state that we are considering. In this case, I am only considering 20 states, but it actually can be for any non-negative integer. And the graph looks like this. So, well, I, I didn't include a summary, but yeah, basically the main idea of the chapter is uh, assign numbers to events, and then we can work with such numbers to get an idea of, for example, of expected results from experiment, or to get these limiting objects, that is the deviation, sorry, a standard deviation from a random variable, and the expectation of a random variable, and they are limiting objects of the mean and the standard deviation that we are used to working, uh, with empirical data, right? 
that it is approximating the behavior in the population where such samples were taken from. So that, that is one of their main uses. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, next week we will go through um, I don't know, some or all of the problems um, for this this chapter, the exercises, uh, and that will be up to you to lead again, <laughs> Lucio. So, um, I think uh, like Ron did with you know, pick out your favorite questions is probably the best way to go or just questions that catch your eye and we can all try to find things this week um, to talk about. But yes, Lucio, you choose which exercises you want to talk about unless one of us brings it up in a timely manner. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'll try to, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, if you do choose them soon enough, if you could post them yeah. in Slack to let us know which ones you pick, because I would, there are a lot of them. I start looking at them like, I'm not gonna have time to do all of these. So I'd rather do the ones that you choose, Lucio. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Um, and if any of us see any that we think look particularly awesome, we can point those out on Slack as well. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. Well, I guess I will see everyone next week. Excellent.